Hello, my name is Dave Oja. Today I'm going to be talking about Fractal, Post-Quantum Recursive Smarts. This is a joint work with Alessandro Chiesa and Nick Spooner. So this on the title, I'm going to be talking about recursive snarks. I'm going to assume everyone here is familiar with what snarks are, but you may not be familiar with uh, recursively composing them. So recursion in this context means verifying a snark proof within a snark. And this comes up when you want to verify iterated function application that like if you apply f t times to x equals y. So here's a diagram of iterated function application. And strategy to prove this is going to be to prove it iteration by iteration. So first, I'm going to prove that f of z0 equals z1. And, and then to verify this, you just run the snark verifier on z1 and pi1. And this convinces you that f of z0 equals z1. In the next iteration, we're going to prove that uh, f of z1 equals z2. and that uh, the verifier accepts the proof for z1. So when you go to check the proof for z2, you're inductively convinced that z1 is valid and therefore uh, z2 equals f of f of z0. And in the next iteration, you prove that f of z2 equals z3 and the proof for z2 is valid. And again, like inductively, you're convinced then that z3 is correct. And this has a number of like very desirable properties. For example, the, the size of every statement you prove is independent of the number of times you apply the function. And similarly, the proof size is independent of the number of times you apply the function. And you can verify every intermediate proof. So uh, if you have a computation that goes on forever, you can then verify the latest state. And also, you can have different people uh, like create proofs for different uh, transitions in here. So some applications of uh, recursive composition are succinct blockchains, like Coda. There, what you would do is you'd make f your state machine transition function. And then you would, uh, one way to do it is to have your block proposer provide a proof with every block they provide. Another application is continuous verifiable delay functions. And uh, snarks for MapReduce applications. So cryptographically, what we want to build is uh, two things. Incrementally verifiable computation, which is what I showed on the previous slide, and, and proof carrying data, which is a generalization to IBC. In proof carrying data, uh, essentially you can recurse along any uh, directed acyclic graph. So there's this theorem from a paper a couple years ago that every adaptively secure, succinct verifier snark can recurse. So this means like you start with a snark and you recurse in the natural sense and you'll get proof carrying data. And this compilation procedure uh, preserves many properties of, of the underlying snark. It starts with a zero knowledge snark, you'll get zero knowledge PCD. It preserves the setup type. So if you have a tr trusted setup snark, you'll get trusted setup PCD. And a transparent snark will yield a transparent PCD. But what about post quantum? So BCC T13 says nothing about this. So uh, we answer that yes, if you have a a post-quantum snark, and you recurse it, you will get post-quantum PCD. This is not like a straightforward generalization of ECT13. One of the problems is that quantum adversaries can generate their own randomness. So previously, you would assume that like, your adversary is deterministic, uh, because if you had a probabilistic one, you could just fix its randomness and get a deterministic adversary. Whereas here, uh, we have to fix that, because quant in the quantum setting, that's not true. Adversaries can always generate their own randomness. So the solution is to define a sufficient notion of post-quantum knowledge soundness, and then prove it secure for our construction in the quantum random oracle model. So now uh, I want to move on to recursion in practice. It's, we want to actually uh, use these things. So here's a list of many smarts that we know. And here is a succinct verifier ones. So from BCCT13, we know all of these can asymptotically recurse. However, in practice, this is not what we see. Instead, it's just this much smaller set, uh, Graal 16, Planck, Sonic, and Marlin, that we've actually achieved practical PCD for. And this is a very small set. Like, so this is the question, what is the make snark suitable for recursion? All of these snarks are pairing-based, trusted setup snarks. Hopefully, there's transparent PCD that we can get, and uh, 
post-quantum PCD that we can get. Now, uh, at this point, I do also want to note that with new techniques that came out uh, very recently, like Halo, that you can recurse bulletproofs and uh, get PCD, but this does not have a succinct verifier. I'm not going to spend uh, any more time this, on that in this talk, but uh, we do want to know what, is it is, what it is that made pra uh, PCD practical for these succinct verifier snarks. And we identify what it is as pre-processing. So a pre-processing snark is one which your verifier is given a small digest of your circuit. And we show that this implies efficient recursion. If you have a pre-processing snark, the cost of proving the recursive step is essentially the same as the cost of proving your original circuit. So we mean this in a mathematical sense, like the recursive step is, has a sublinear additive overhead over proving your original circuit. So if we compare this to the prior method of uh, for formalizing this recursion, you would start with the snark for a machine relation. And then every time you wanted to go and prove it, you'd have to change, sorry, like do a recursive step. You have to change the machine you're uh, running. And then to get unbounded recursion, you would need to use a universal simulator. And this incurs a universal simulation overhead. So instead of it being one plus little one, it would be C times prover time your original function. And the universal simulation overhead is a multiple factor greater than one. And in practice is a very large multiplicative factor. So uh, this is why like recursing these generic machines has not been achieved in practice. So it also tells us that if our goal is to create a, uh, an efficient PCD scheme, we should focus on creating a pre-processing snark. So this is exactly what we do. We're going to create a post-quantum pre-processing snark for R1CS. And moreover, this is going to be a transparent snark. So all prior constructions of pre-processing snarks were pre-quantum and require trusted setups. Here, we're going to do it uh, transparently and in the quantum random oracle model. So our construction is called fractal. And it has the following asymptote as products, like we have a quasi-linear prover, logarithmic verifier, and logarithmic proof size. And each of these matches the best known non-pre-processing post-quantum snark. Concretely, like these running times are, uh, the prover times are in minutes, verifier times in milliseconds, and the proof size is one, 200 kilobytes. And we have an implementation of this, so we can actually see some concrete graphs of this. So fact, to instantiate fractal, we have to fix a random oracle. So here we're going to use Blake 2B. And here I've plotted the verifier time of several snarks. So in black is fractal. Well, Aurora is a state of the art uh, post quantum snark for circuits that is a non pre processing. And then Marlin and Gross 16 are uh, state of the art uh, pairing based trust setup snarks for circuits as well. So we see that. Uh, for Aurora, it's non preprocessing, it's a linear verifier time. Whereas amongst all these uh, pre processing snarks, they're log constant or logarithmic. And the, the actual constants for running time are very similar, like around 10 milliseconds. And for proof size, we see that Fractal's uh, proof size is about twice as big as Aurora's. But in exchange, we've got this exponential verifier time improvement. So it's just uh, quite nice. Uh, here, I didn't plot the Marlin and Gross 16 proof sizes because they're extremely small, like one to two kilobytes. And then finally, the prover times. So all of these grow in the same way asymptotically. It's n log n. And uh, the difference between the slowest and fastest thing is like a factor of 10. But to some extent, this can even be explained away with implementation differences, like different finite field libraries, et cetera. So there's not, I don't think there's too much interesting things going on there. It's, they're all remarkably similar. So now we have a fractal standalone snark. Let's look at how we get PCD. So we start with fractal in the quantum random oracle model. Then we apply the random oracle heuristic to get fractal in uh, the uniform reference string. And the random, random oracle heuristic is instantiating the random oracle, the strong hash, and then assuming that security carries over. This is being used in increasingly many snarks, like Sonic, Marlin, Planck, Bulletproofs, all of the post-quantum snarks, etc. 
And then we apply theorem one. So then from fractal, th uh, from fractal we'll get PCD. So this is going to be the first PCD construction with any of the following properties. Post quantum security, a transparent setup, and support for arithmetic over any large smooth field, like binary fields and fields that don't support uh, efficient elliptic curves, uh, et cetera. So now we want to go into real, actually like using recur uh, recursing fractal. So to recurse, we have to express the verifier in a language that the SNARK understands. And this will always lead to new efficiency considerations. For example, to recurse cross 16, you have to use pairing friendly cycles of elliptic curves for efficiency. So in Fractal, your verifier has two components, algebra and a bunch of hashes. And normally when you run it, these take about the same amount of time. But when you go to recurse, it actually looks like this. Hashes take over 99% of your constraint system size. So <laughs> the choice of hash function and how you arithmetize is extremely important. So if we use a standard hash like Blake or Shaw, they, they're optimized for computer hardware. So they take like around 200 nanoseconds to actually run, which is incredibly fast. But uh, in R1CS, they're pretty bad. They take around 20,000 constraints. So if we wanted to use this for fractal, we'd have a constraint system size of uh, over 2 to the 28 gates. This is too expensive. Like We can't actually run snarks this big. So instead, we have to look towards like algebraic hashes. It's new line of work. This includes things like Poseidon, Rescue, Vision, and Mimsy. The time to execute these hashes on hardware is much slower, like around 10 milliseconds. But in exchange, the constraints for every hash is much better, around like 300. So this means that the fractal constraint system size would be a, under 2 million constraints, which is something we can actually execute. So this is exciting. This means we can actually run the, fract the recurse fractal. And as a general rule, your biggest cost of doing recursion is going to be doing cryptography inside of your SNARK. So uh, here, what I've, uh, I'm going to plot some of the cost of the fractal verifier using Poseidon as a random oracle. So in blue, here, that's the number of constraints that we're proving. And in black, we have plotted the size of the verifier here in constraints. So it grows logarithmically as expected because we have a logarithmic verifier time. So the crossover point at which the uh, verifier constraint system size is less than the number of uh, constraints like being proven is around one million constraints. So this blue shaded triangle is the practical practical region of recursing, where like your verifier overhead is less than. Uh, the original circuit you're proving. So taking a candidate point in here, where your circuit size is 6 million, this blue thing, the size of your recursive step is going to be uh, the blue, this blue value plus the black value, which is around 8 million constraints. And since this black line is a verifier size is logarithmic, we can say that for regions that like we can, uh, of circuits we can execute, the size of your recursive circuit is around your original circuit size plus 2 million constraints. I do want to note that like, this recursive overhead represents an unoptimized proof of concept. Uh, and the prover is over 10 times slower than standalone fractal because these algebraic hashes are much slower. But there's a lot of things you can do to improve both of these. So this is all I want to say about uh, the theorems of our work. And now I want to go into a bit of how do you actually create a post-quantum preprocessing SNARK. So all SNARKs have sort of look like this. You start with information theoretic proof system, and you have a cryptographic compiler. You combine these together, and you'll get a SNARK. So because we want a post-quantum uh, SNARK, we're going to need a post-quantum cryptographic compiler. And because we want to be preprocessing, we're going to need what's called a holographic proof system. Combining these, we'll get a post-quantum preprocessing SNARK. So what is a holographic proof system? To explain this, I'm going to first fall back to uh, explaining a, P a PCP. So in a PCP, uh, the prover wants to prove that like, it knows a witness such that the circuit is satisfied. So the prover uh, gives you a very large proof string pi, 
And the verifier uses the circuit, and it will query the proof string pi at a couple random locations. But the verifier has to know what is the circuit it is verifying. Therefore, the time from the verifier is at least linear in the circuit size. A holographic verifier is one in which the verifier has access to an error-tolerant encoded version of the circuit. So in a holographic PCP, the, uh, the verifier no longer has C as an input. It's just X the instance. And instead, there's this third trust entity called the indexer who takes in the circuit and outputs an encoded version of it. And now, uh, to check a proof, the verifier is going to query both the proof string pi and the indexer's output of the circuit uh, out of some random locations and be convinced if uh, the prover does indeed know such a witness or not. So the time from the indexer is going to be at least linear in the circuit size. But now the verifier can run in time much smaller than the circuit size. So it no longer has to have it as an input. And I, I mentioned the indexer is uh, trusted. Well, it, we're going to make it into a pre-processing step. So how do we do this? First, we start the holographic PCP. And then we're going to uh, get a holographic snark by applying the Macaulay transformation. So what is this? Uh, you essentially take the proof string pi, and you, the prover is going to Merkleize it, and send the Merkle root to the verifier. And then the verifier is going to query the Merkle uh, root at a couple of random locations, and sorry, the Merkle tree, and uh, get values of the proof string pi and Merkle tree authentication paths. But this new verifier, v prime, uses v as a black box. Like it's going to get the values of the proof string pi and then just run what it ran before. And so in particular, we didn't touch how it interacts with the, ind the indexer. So this is why it's a holographic snark. And then we're going to compile this into a pre-processing snark. What we do is we're going to use a Merkle tree to compress the encoded circuit. And in the pre-processing phase, what, uh, you're going to have this proof string, or this like indexed out, uh, encoded circuit, and Merkleize it. And the verifier ju is just going to store the Merkle root. And then the prover, uh, whenever the verifier wants to query this encoded circuit, the prover is going to supply an authentication path for the Merkle root that the verifier has already preprocessed. And hence, we get a preprocessing snark. And so this connection between holography and preprocessing is first noticed in Marlin. In, and in this work, we extend it to apply to uh, Merkleizing your encoded circuit and therefore supporting the post-quantum transparency use case. And we can replace Macaulay, the Macaulay transformation from holographic PCP with any uh, black box transformation. So what we're actually going to do is to use the BCS16 transformation, which is the analog uh, for IOPs to get a pre-processing snark from a holographic IOP. So this just leaves us with, how do we get a, a holographic IOP? Yeah, or when do we get efficient holography? So holographic PCPs were first introduced in the 90s with BFLS. And many protocols have like naturally holographic uh, alternatives, like GKR and Aurora. But the problem is this natural encoding is super linear. Which in GKR, the encoded circuit uh, would require a polynomial blow up. For Aurora, you deal with R1CS matrices. And these are like n by n matrices that typically only have a O of n non-zero entries. So the natural encoding of such a matrix is going to be a bivariate polynomial of degree n by n, such that like it encodes uh, every position in the matrix. So this means that uh, the encoding is going to require writing down the entire matrix, which is a t uh, takes time at least n squared. We can't actually run that for sizable circuits. So it has way too high of a uh, preprocessor time and prover time blow. So instead, we're going to need a linear sized encoding of these matrices because uh, leveraging the fact that they're sparse. So here's a sp candidate sparse matrix M. And essentially, we're going to uh, write down three values for every non-zero entry. The value of the entry, the row it's on, and the column. So like, to unpack this, like, we take a candidate 
location here, like A, it appears in row three and column one. Hence, this like slice of these vectors is a A31. And each of these vectors has length linear in the number of non-zero entries. Since there's only three such vectors, we have a linear sized encoding. But now, in order to actually use this in a SNARK, we're going to need an algebraic way of a, evaluating m at any of these points. So to do this, uh, I just have to introduce the equality function, where uh, it returns 1 if its two inputs are equal, like quality uh, i comma i, and then otherwise return 0. So it, our arithmetization of m is going to be as follows. We're going to iterate over every element. And then uh, the i coordinate is going to essentially correspond to the row we're looking at. And the, the j value is going to correspond to the column we're looking at. To actually unpack this, uh, let's evaluate it at a point. So let's look at m of 3, 1. So when k equals 1, we're going to look at row of k, or like row of 1. And so that's this value right here, 3. So the quality of 3 and 3 is uh, 1. Similarly, column of k, the like column of 1, is 1. And this equality value is also 1. So this term, the summation, is going to be value of 1, or, which is a. But for every other term, it's going to be the case that either row of k is not 3 or column of k is not 1. Hence, one of these two equality polynomials is going to be 0. So every other term, the summation, is 0. Therefore, uh, it equals a. And we can evaluate this expression using the univariate sum check protocol of Aurora. This is a quite technical slide. Uh, now I want to take a step, like a second to zoom out and summarize what I've talked about. So we showed that post-quantum recursion yields post-quantum PCD. We also show that pre-processing implies efficient recursion. And then we construct a, an efficient post-quantum pre-processing snark called Fractal. And the way we construct Fractal was by compiling a holographic IOP that uses sparse matrix encodings for holography. And now together, combining all of these, we uh, get a construction of efficient post-quantum PCD. And as an implementation, we provide Fractal as a pre-processing snark and Fractal as a recursive snark that uses algebraic hashes. Thank you for your time. Uh, the paper and code are both online at these links.